before I answer these questions, I've been away for uh, about a month, a little bit more than a month. I have been to uh, three places, uh, Hong Kong, Kuala Lumpur, and uh, China. Um, in Hong Kong, I gave a few lectures, maybe about 10 lectures, two lectures in the Polytechnical University of Hong Kong, and for two nights, so every night there were about an audience of 1,300 people for two evenings. And uh, I haven't been lecturing in Hong Kong for about two years now, but my radio program has always been on, so maybe that gives me the popularity that people like to listen to, to the lectures. The topic of my lecture was the nine stages of mental development in meditation. I have already talked about it in the meditation hall. Um, it's a new subject because usually people just meditate and they do not know, they do not know the real technique. And even if they know the technique of doing it, they cannot identify with the technique clearly. In ordinary life, we say uh, there are two kinds of, two categories of uh, objects of our senses. Object of our senses? Object of, a sen of our senses pertaining to the common people an object of our senses pertaining to the, the, the cultivator of the Buddhist teaching. The two kinds, the two kinds of object of the senses. Um, and for the common people, what are the objects of the senses? You have to identify them. You have to make it very clearly that you understand the object of our senses when we are common, ordinary, um, temporal, sentient beings, and the object of our senses when we uh, walk from the ignorant, confused world into the path of enlightenment. We're not there yet, but we're walking that path. So what are the, what are the, what are the, um, the objects of our senses usually for the common people, for us? For, for people who, don't, who, haven't, who did not know how to practice the Buddhist teaching. What are the objects of our senses? Do you know them? Do you, can you identify them? If you say, I don't, I, don't I, I, I do not know. Well, you know. It's just you, don't, you haven't delineated them in your mind. What is the object of your senses of the eyes? The objects are everything you see. The eyes corresponds to, to matter, to form. What is meditation anyway? First of all, before we start. Meditation is about the mind. It's not about blessings, it's about the mind. When we interact with the world, how do we interact with? When we interact with the world, we interact with the senses. Our senses interact with the world. What are our senses? Our eyes, ears, nose, tongue, touch, the body, and then the, the mentality, the manas, consciousness. So the six senses. The five, we already know, the five eyes, oh, those are the I always give the, the metaphor that they are the salesmen of our body. They are right at the front door, interacting with the outside world. The, they are the salesmen. And these salesmen, of course, salesmen usually, what do salesmen do? Salesmen interact with customers. What your eyes interact with? Your eyes interact with form, you see things. Why do we have to know all these? Because do you want to know your own mind? Do you want to understand yourself? 
the first step in practicing Buddhism is to understand your mind, yourself. Not just blindly believe in a, in a supernatural being we call Buddha. No, no, that's not. That's superstition. We don't, have, we, don't, we don't carry on blind faith in here. No, we don't do blind faith. We want to analyze our mind. We want to know our minds to such a degree that we want to stop it from doing unvirtuous behavior. We always want to do virtuous behavior, benefiting yourself and benefiting others. So that's the reason why in, 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 in Buddhism, we really have to understand the mind first. When you understand the mind, you've got to understand, understand this salesman. Buddhism is, I'm not going into the senses, the six senses, because I talked about them before. The reason why I mentioned them is, when I study Buddhism, I try to digest it and present it from the perspective of the temporal world. I won't just say, take a page from the, from the Buddhist Sutra and then one word by one word um, delineate to you the meaning of it. I want to take a sutra, an extract from it, and view that that extract um, with reference with, from the perspective of the outside world. So you really have to understand your mind first, then you have to understand how do you interact with, your, with the outside world from the senses, and how the senses interact too, and how does the internal senses interact. The internal, the, the, the sale, other than the salesman, there's always a manager behind you, in the mind. And that's what we call the hidden consciousness. Because the eyes see, but the eyes do not by itself differentiate. It's the manager behind that controls it. And that manager not only controls the salesman, but also have all kinds of files in the filing cabinets. The old data of yesterday, of the past, the data of the present, and the data, and, and the budgets of the future. That's how our mind functions. So if you understand all these, then you know, why am I meditating? Why am I putting my attention to the breath, to, to my nose tip? Because you want your, all these objects are so various, multiplicity of them, and you want to simplify them into one object to train your own mind. And the one, that one object is Anapanasati. So that's how I carry on my conversation. And I find that that approach is very acceptable to people. Because you're not away from the, from, from, from the world when you, when you talk about Buddhism. When you start to talk about blessings from Buddha, and how do you, uh, how do you, uh, how, 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 how does your health improve, or how do you have happiness from, from a sitting of meditation? I think that is a, a second degree. The first degree is how your mind interacts. Then you slowly lead people into understanding the importance of, and, 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 and the understanding of the real technique of Buddhism. First question, if something had happens to your child whose karma, uh, whose karma is that from? As a parent, we uh, like, we think it is partly the parent's karma, then what is your view on this? If something happened to your child, nothing happens without a cause. There's no such thing as causeless happening. There's not, no such thing as a happening without any reason. The Madhyamaka Sutra says, there's nothing without a cause. That's why it is sunyata. Do you know what sunyata is? Emptiness. That's why it's emptiness. So, if you ask me something happened to your child, of course, that happening is due to karma. And I think it's not just the karma of the child, because karma are uh, multi-related. 
Actually, nothing does not relate to karma. So it's just like every, every hair in the follicle of, of your skin. If one hair got blown by, by a wind and it feels itchy, you feel the itchiness. The body feels the itchiness. One hair gets to breeze, the whole body feels it. How many hairs in the body? One pertains to, to all and all pertains to one. We have two kinds of karma, specific karma and common karma. Probably you and the child are together in a family that's common to you both. Or common to the parents and the child, so there's common karma. They, they're in the same family, they enjoy the same meal, uh, or they enjoy the same richness, or, or poverty, um, or um, the same level of, of, of livelihood. But then, there's also specific karma. If the child, something happens to the child, uh, then the spe specific karma dominated the child. Or maybe the child gets sick, or something happened to the child. Or maybe the child become uh, uh, an extremely rich man. It all differs. So I would say karma is all related. So don't create any bad karma. Where does, bad, where, where does karma come from? Where does karma come from? From Buddha? No, no. From God? Definitely not. Not. The, the, the all-kindly God would not give you the, the bad karma. Otherwise, he wouldn't be called God. So, where does karma come from? Karma comes from a thought. When you think about something, there's this energy. So don't stay away to think something bad. Always maintain that uh, the healthiness of, of, of a good thought. Always have good thought. Because every karma, what is karma? Karma is an accumulation of your behavior, of your speech, of your thought of the present life, of the future life, and related to your, uh, I mean, of your present life, your past life, and related to the future life. So if, to answer this question, is it the child's karma or the parent's karma? It's both. But something happened to the child, the child's karma is heavier. Karma follows the track, the track of causality. If I can give you an example, it will be something like this. The CN Railway uh, across Canada. That railway on which the train is traveling all the time, is rolling on all the time, that train rolls on a track. That track, that railway track, is causality because it, it, it guides the whole karma, it guides the train. That train is the karma. So karma and, and the causality is one and the same. If the, tra if the train cannot be out of the, tr of the track, cannot be out of causality. Okay, that's enough for this. Second question. People wonder how to make sense of events such as Japan earthquake and tsunami. Is it just karma, or should we see anything else in such events that take large number of lives? In Hong Kong, in my two lectures in the public, I have at least 10 sheets of paper related to the Japanese earthquake and tsunami. And one interesting thing, interesting thing maybe I should, on the side, I should tell you, uh, right one day before the, uh, the earthquake and the tsunami, I was in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, the reason why I went to Kuala Lumpur is, of course, for visiting. And another reason is because once in a while, I like to get to the sea to soak up all my uh, eczema. I like to 
because I thought that seawater is always good for, for bad skin. Because in, the, in, in, in BC, there's no, there's no chance to go to the, to the shore to swim because it's too cold. But in Asia, no, the, 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 the beach is extremely warm and you can get into the, in the beach even in winter time to swim. So I, I, I thought I'd make use of this time to go bypass the Kuala Lumpur to get to a beach to, to soak up my, uh, my bad skin. And I was swimming in there and on an island and there were waves coming up. And um, to make the story short, I was almost caught in the wave. I never had that experience before. This kind of wave, when they come, they rush to you, and then you think that they would, they would recede again, they would, they would get back. But then, once in a while, they pull you back, and I think they call it undercurrent. Not every wave has undercurrent, but you don't know which one has. So I was, I was at, at, at my ankle deep water, and the wave was what, about three, four feet. Quite a, a lot of waves. And that's one day before the tsunami. And, and, and of course, Kuala Lumpur is close to Japan. Closer than, than BC, anyway. So I, was, I thought that, oh, it was safe. Well, I walk a little further and up to my knees. Then I walk a little further up to almost my thigh. And then I was, when I look at the waves coming to me, I said, no, something is not right. Because the wave seems to have a, have a certain pulling effect. So I immediately want to walk back to the beach. But I couldn't. Another wave came up and tried to engulf me. And, I, and then it was at my waist level. And when that wave come, it rushes you to shore. But at the same time, at the end of it, it tries to push you down. It's just pushing you down, not just pulling you away, but it pushes you down to the bottom. So if, if you're standing on the sand, you say the sand is only a, 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 maybe a four feet deep or three feet deep, you, you thought you were standing on the sand. If anything happened, then you can walk back to the beach. But actually, when the wave comes to you, it depressed down, and even the sand, they carry it away. So all of a sudden, the four feet deep uh, becomes a six feet because even the sand would get pulled away. So I was pulled out. I pulled out, I was trying to swim as fast as I can. <laughs> I, was pulled, I, I tried to swim as fast as I can, but I couldn't. Because I was sucked down to the bottom. And then another wave come, I was pulled another 10 yards. I, I get further and further away from, from the shore. It was extremely dangerous. And then there was a lifeguard there, very far away at that corner. And this guy was also getting all his binoculars and binoculars and seeing things. But I find out that lifeguards, um, especially the irresponsible ones, um, they're sleeping. They're not paying attention to every swimmer. So he's not looking my way. And you think you can ask for help when, you have, when, you have, when you're being caught by undercurrent, you can ask for help? No. Because you use so much of your energy to swim, trying to swim ashore and being pulled by undercurrent underneath that you don't have any breath. And when you cry for help, only help, help. I mean, it's not like in a movie. Help! Not like in a movie. They, they dramatize it. You think you can... Maybe they, because they want the audience to know that that actor is screaming for help, so the sound is higher. But in, in, in fact, you, you have no energy to call for help because you use up all your energy to swim ashore. So another wave come and pull out another 10 feet. And I thought, that's the end. Adios to the meditation class. <laughs> And I, at that time, a lot of thought flashes to me. Is it all done? Is it all finished? How do I explain? Uh, how can I explain all these things? And then I swim 
And then someone was swimming my way and stretched out his hands. I'm trying to catch his hands. And then I was rushed back again, and I tried to reach another hand. And then I was rushed back again. It was already, someone is already helping me, seeing my difficulty. So, you know what I did? At the last moment, I remember something. And I call it three times. Namo Avalokitesvara Bodhisattva. And I don't have any breath. I just say, Namo Avalokitesvara Bodhisattva. I didn't say, Namo Avalokitesvara Bodhisattva. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have any, I have no breath anymore. No energy. So, Namo Avalokitesvara Bodhisattva. Just very silently, three times. And then another hand was stretched out to me and I, I caught that hand. And all of a sudden, another wave pushed me a little further. Maybe that time without any undercurrent. And I walked a few steps. I wasn't sure. So what do we learn from that lesson? When you are in danger, that's the only way. Because Avalokitesvara is overseeing everything. It's giving you the protection. But then I said, if I was given protection, how come I have to experience this first? Why, sh why shouldn't I be, be um, immune from that kind of experience? Maybe I was destined to, to experience it so I, th I can tell people and never swim when it's too wavy because there's undercurrent. And it happens right before the tsunami. So the sea changes. Waves change. You think that waves, oh, wave, every wave is like that. No. When something strange happens, it may just be the wave to take your life away. And I think it's a change of the ocean current and something like that. And people can see if people are, are, are very sensitive with it, they, they know that something would happen. And later I was able to walk, the next day I was able to walk to another beach where there's another resort. And I was told that two guys died on that date, just one day before, pulled out of the sea, disappeared. When you swim on a, on a beach, neighboring on, a, on, on an ocean, if you're pulled out by an undercurrent, they don't find you anymore. Unless you use a helicopter the next day to find your own co your, your body floating, being rushed on shore. Uh, the chance is slim because you could have been swallowed up by fish already, eaten by fish already. So um, I'm not making up this story for you. <laughs> That's real experiences. And... Um, so make sure that you chant in the Chinese. I, I chant in the Chinese language anyway. In the Cantonese, in Cantonese, which is the same as Namo Avalokitesvara Bodhisattva. And it's extremely effective for me, just three times. And I don't know why the next, the next wave that rushed me ashore does not contain, did not contain any undercurrent. Every, almost every wave is undercurrent. That's why the next day something happened to the other side in, in the Japanese um, tsunami and earthquake. I think the sea changes, the, the ocean, ocean wave, they all, they all change. It does not matter. Uh, we, we always have to be conscientious in helping out people, victims of the earthquake and tsunami.